global accounting network, providing auditing, accounting, taxation, and consulting services in over 1,300 offices worldwide, now in 154 countries, with over 7 billion U.S. dollars in revenues and 60,000 people all over the globe. Uh, before we get started, and if we can move to slide two, uh, let me address some administrative matters. First, this webinar qualifies for continuing professional education. To get a credit, you need to listen to the entire program and respond to the polling question. These questions will not be announced, but will appear from time to time on the right-hand side of your screen throughout the presentation, and there will be five polling questions. If you are logged in, in the, for the entire uh, webinar and respond to all the polling questions, you will be notified via email when your PD certificate is ready. You can ask questions during the webinar. Please use the Q&A feature, which is in the top right-hand part of your screen, and please send questions to all panelists. We will address as many of the questions as we can at the end of the webinar. And finally, we are recording this webinar. We will email you the slide deck for this webinar, as well as the link to the recording a few days after today. Um, this link will also include a link to a survey asking for your input on this webinar, as well as your suggestions for topics that you would like to see covered in our 2016 webinar series. Please complete the survey as we find your feedback very valuable to us and so that we address topics that are of importance to you. Uh, more information on our 2016 webinars will come out in early 2016. Please move to slide three. Today's webinars won't cover all of the OECD best recommendations. Rather, we will focus on those key recommendations that we think will have the most impact on multinational companies and how they manage their global tax expense. After a brief introduction by me, we will deal with the recommendations on interest deductibility for interest international businesses and hybrid financing arrangements, transfer pricing and the new country-by-country -country reporting requirements, treaty benefits and the recommendations designed to prevent tax treaty abuse, the impact of the recommended changes to the definition of permanent establishments, and harmful tax competition and the impact of the recommendations on preferential tax regimes. We'll follow this with some observation from our colleagues in the world's two largest economies, the U.S. and China, and then we'll conclude with a Q&A. So if you could just go to slide four, please. Speaking with you today, uh, we have a great panel of BDO international tax professionals. Joe Caliano is the head international tax partner in our U.S. firm's national tax office based in Washington, D.C. Malcolm Joy is an international tax partner based in London in the UK and is our global leader for value chain, chain planning. Hans Nordemir is the head of the international tax group of our Dutch firm based in Rotterdam. And finally, Jay Tang is a tax director in charge of our Chinese transfer pricing practice based in Shanghai. So first, I'm going to give you a bit of an overall introduction before turning things over to our panel. Uh, slide five, please. So the OECD project was triggered as a direct result of the global financial crisis that started in the fall of 2008. As a result of this crisis, many governments saw their tax revenues drop substantially. This ultimately resulted in the spotlight being turned on multinational companies and the amount of income tax they were paying on their global profits. Several high-profile cases were highlighted in the media Amazon, Google, and Starbucks being very good examples, focusing on their global profits and the very low effective corporate tax rates that they were paying on these profits. This led to the perception by both politicians and the media that multinational groups were using the international tax system in ways that it was never intended to substantially reduce the amount of income taxes that they were pay paying. The belief was that the international tax system was no longer fit for purpose. In 2013, the G20 countries asked the OECD to look at these issues and make recommendations on how the international tax system needed to be fixed. In July 2013, the OECD released a report 
action plan on base erosion and profit shifting that set out a very aggressive timetable to analyze 15 action points and make recommendations. These 15 action points all fit under one or more of three core principles of the BEPS project. The first principle is coherence and establishing international coherence of corporate income taxation. Coherence is achieved when the tax rules of different countries ensure that income earned by a multinational group is subject to tax and the group cannot minimize or eliminate taxation by exploiting differences in the way countries treat a particular amount. The second principle of the BEPS project is economic substance and restoring the full effects and benefits of international standards through realignment of taxation and relevant substance. So in other words, this is the principle that the taxation of a multinational group's profits should happen in the jurisdiction where the business activities that generate, generated that profit occur. And finally, the third principle is transparency and ensuring transparency of a multinational group's activities while also promoting increased certainty and predictability to taxpayers on how income will be taxed in an international environment. This relates to disclosure by taxpayers about where their business activities are carried out, where they are paying taxes, and what their tax planning activities are. It also relates to improvements and mechanisms to improve how cross-border tax disputes are resolved. In performing its work, the OECD went beyond consulting the OECD member countries. 62 countries were involved directly in the consultations, including non-OECD members such as China and India, which covered over 80% of the global economy, as well as also consulting with a number of regional bodies in an attempt to cover the rest of the world. The OECD believes that this process they've undertaken has been as inclusive a process that, they've, that has ever been done on tax issues. The final recommendations were issued on October 5, 2015. The OECD has now started to focus on working with countries to actually implement their recommendations. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Hans Nordemir, who will discuss interest deductibility and hybrid financing arrangements. Hans, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, BEPS Action 2. This action is aimed at structures with hybrids. All these structures have in common that untaxed income is created and this action point is aimed at preventing this from happening. Solutions are recommended for both domestic law as well as for tax treaties. The domestic law solution is that for all these instruments and entities, there's a recommendation to implement a so-called primary rule and a defensive or secondary rule. In simple terms, the primary rule is denying the deduction of the payment at the level of the payer jurisdiction. A secondary or defensive rule is introduced as a safety measure in the case that the paying country has not adopted the primary rule. The secondary rule is then to tax the income. For each of the hybrid forms, rules are proposed along these lines with some slight variations. For treaties, the solution is in the first place to deny dual resident entities as well as hybrid entities access to the treaty. On top of that, it also needs to be made sure that the treaties cannot override the solutions to be implemented in domestic law. For instance, if a treaty exempts dividends, then one must make sure that the domestic solution for hybrid income can override this, as otherwise the domestic measures for the hybrids would not have any effect. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see an example of a structure that is called we have a hybrid entity in country B, which is disregarded by country A. The primary rule would be that in B, there is no deduction of the interest expense. If B doesn't implement the rule, then A should tax the income. Next slide, please. On this slide, we see an exa another example. Again, a hybrid entity in country B, disregarded by country A. The primary rule would be that in B, there is no deduction, and again, if B has not implemented the primary rule, then A should not allow the deduction. Next slide, please. This is a slightly more complex uh, example. We have a hybrid loan going from parent A to Finco B, 
as we have an ordinary loan going from FINCO B to OPCO C. And the solution here would be that there's no deduction of the interest expense in, in OPCO C. Next slide, please. So, some attention to planning points. The first thing to notice is that the rules apply automatically. There's no purpose test or something like that. It's further important to know that the rules do not apply to situations where the income isn't taxed immediately, but at a later stage. However, this taxation must happen within 12 months. The rules also do not apply to tax arbitrage situations. So this means that if the income isn't taxed because it's received in a no tax country, or if the income is taxed at lower rates, the rules do not apply. Besides no or low tax, also situations where the recipient can make use of tax attributes, such as losses, the rules do not apply either. So it means that there's still room for some simple tax arbitrage planning. It's also important to realize that the rules are specifically designed for actual payments and not payments that are merely deemed payments for tax purposes. So if a deduction arises without an actual payment, then the rules also do not apply. So it appears that the notion of interest deduction facilities are not called by the rules under Action 2. The same would be the case for interest-free loans, where deemed interest deductions may apply depending on transfer pricing rules in the country where the debtor is located. And finally, the rules are also not applicable to a situation where a payment doesn't take place. However, the BEPS recommendations do state that countries may consider extending the rules to all situations where there is a deductible item for tax purposes. Joe, can you please uh, briefly comment on how you see this action two uh, happening from a U.S. tax perspective? Yeah, thanks, Hans. And it's worth noting a lot of U.S.-based multinationals do have hybrid instruments in play. They do have um, hybrid entities and their organizational structure. From a U.S. perspective, there have been some proposals by President Obama's administration that are very BEPS-like proposals. Um, these proposals came out in, in the Met when the BEPS project was really underway, um, and they're really targeting certain types of hybrid arrangements. Um, for instance, one of the proposals by the administration was to restrict the use of hybrid arrangements that create stateless income. This proposal was is designed to deny deductions for interest and royalty payments made to related entities under circumstances involving a hybrid arrangement. For instance, where no you have no corresponding inclu, income inclusion in the recipient by the recipient in the foreign jurisdiction. Um, there's another proposal that the administration had that would limit the application of certain of our subpart F rules for certain transactions involving reverse hybrids. So there have been proposals in the U.S that are very BEPS-like proposals designed to address some of these issues. There's also been proposals to repeal the check-the-box rules. Um, obviously, the check-the-box regulations make hybrid planning relatively simple by checking a box to uh, have a classification in the U.S. different from a foreign jurisdiction. Um, a lot of these proposals as well, dealing with check-the-box or hybrid um, entities, really need congressional approval, so um, there needs to be action, and that's where the difficulty is in the United States with respect to changing at least domestic law, and even treaties, when you change treaties, generally the United States requires a treaty modification and approval by the Senate, so there's a more elaborate process. It is worth noting there are some provisions in, in U.S. domestic law dealing with hybrids, like 894C has some rules dealing with hybrids, and hybrids, and there are certain anti-hybrid provisions, like in Article 1.6 of the U.S. model, that are designed to deal with hybrids. But as it relates to a lot of the BEPS-type proposals and, and the proposals made by the administration, those generally will require congressional approval, and that's been very difficult. Anyone who's been following U.S. Internet, U.S. politics knows that there's um, uh, different views on how things should be handled, especially international tax reform. So 
As it stands right now, there are a number of proposals that have been made to deal with hybrids, to deal with um, many of the items you were discussing, Hans, but uh, as far as having those implemented in the United States, I think that's a little bit more of an uphill battle. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for this, Joe. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yes, BEPS Action 4. Uh, the main reason for that action point is that international groups seem to deduct far more interest than the amount of interest they pay to third parties. So this implicitly means that there's far more intercompany finance than there's third party finance. What we also see is that in practice the net interest expense falls into the range of some 10% of EBITDA rather than the 30% which is often used in legislation that's currently in place in some other jurisdictions. So this begs the question of how big of an issue is this action point? Probably it's the extremes that are the reason for this action point. The PEPS action point has analyzed several solutions to the problem and comes up with a recommended approach. It concerns the introduction of a fixed net interest to EBITDA ratio, and the ratio can be in the range of 10 to 30 percent. It's not only applied to intercompany interest, but also to third-party interest but for third-party interest, it's proposed to uplift the ratio with 10%. To further accommodate taxpayers, countries can also consider implementing a group ratio rule or an equity escape rule or a limitation that only applies if a certain de minimis amount of interest has been exceeded and also carry forward rules may be implemented. And perhaps some averaging rules for EBITDA can be implemented as EBITDA is a measure that can easily vary. It's also worth noting that uh, there is still some additional work to be done on this uh, action point. Next slide, please. Let's go to some observation about these recommendations under action point four. The rules are mechanical. Again, there's no purpose test or something like that to prevent the rules from applying. The OECD does recognize that changing the finance structure may be a costly process and that there could be constraints as a result of current contractual obligations. So it's recommended that enough time is given for groups to restructure and avoid being caught by the new rules. Having said that, there are already a number of countries that have implemented rules that are similar to the OECD recommended approach. So to a certain extent, one may can expect that there's already quite a number of groups that are complying within the new corridor. Surprisingly, it's also worth noting that the UK considers implementing a rule like this. I think it's also important to realize that Action Point 4 provides for a recommended approach. So it means that countries may choose not to implement, or partially implement, or even implement something completely different. An example of this is, for instance, the Netherlands which has quite a number of targeted rules aimed at restricting the deduction of interest expenses. I would expect that, at least for now, the Netherlands will stick to this targeted approach rather than implementing the OECD mechanical approach. And also other countries may feel the same way. And these differences in implementation can have the effect that groups are faced with some unexpected results and possibly double taxation. Also, the fact that the recommended approach also applies to third-party debt can have significant impact on industries and groups that are high, highly leveraged. Private equity-owned structures and real estate structures come to mind. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we do? Uh, in any case, it would be good to review your financing structure. As regards the interest deduction, Check whether you are in the 10 to 30 percent range. If not, see how flexible your financing arrangement is and whether it can be amended or replaced. Also, you may want to see if influencing EBITDA is an option. Reviewing the transfer pricing position and model may lead to an improvement of the interest deduction position. Furthermore, you may also want to look at the applied interest rates and see to what extent these can be updated to bring you back in the corridor and thus improve the position. As regards to hybrid mismatches, if structures are in place, you would need to see what, to what extent these can be replaced by alternative structures that can meet the same objectives. For instance, low or no taxation of certain elements of income. 
Now uh, I hand over to Malcolm for the next topic. Thanks, Hans. So we're going to look now at transfer pricing. And as John mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, one of the key aims of the BEPS project is to make sure that when a multinational makes profits, these profits are, are actually taxed in the location where the value is created. And the question of allocation of profits is something that's dealt with by transfer pricing rules around the world. Most countries already had transfer pricing rules in place prior to the, the BEPS initiative, but there was still a perception uh, from the G20 that profits were not being attributed to the different countries in the right way. So no surprise then that the OEC decided to take a, a closer look at the transfer pricing rules. Now, what we saw in the final report on the 5th of October was a rewrite of many parts of the, the OECD guidelines that deal with transfer pricing. The, these are guidelines that are followed by a large number of countries around the world in the domestic legislation. And we've got significant additions to the guidelines on how to identify the actual transaction itself, how risk is allocated around a group, and how companies should be rewarded for the ownership of intangibles in particular. So the new guidelines reaffirm the use of the arm's length principle as the basis for allocating profits. And the guidelines are looking to make sure that the transactions within the group that are taking place are described very accurately. And these descriptions do genuinely uh, reflect what is happening. I think that's one of the big problems for multinationals. Often uh, structures are put in place, uh, rules or, or, or guidelines uh, are used to evaluate what's going on, and they find that uh, what, what has been reported is actually slightly different to what's happening in practice. The whole area of intangibles has also been a major area for concern for the OECD because of the unique nature of the intangibles, the difficulty in valuing them, and the ease of transferring intangibles around a group. So we now have a new set of criteria which will be used to assess who the uh, who has the true economic ownership of the intangible in the, within the group. And in particular, companies that have just been cash funded to take legal ownership of the intangible and not uh, do anything else in relation to that intangible can now only expect to get a risk-free financial return. So it's akin to just putting that cash on deposit. Now the next slide. The artificial allocation of risk within a group by multinationals has been a major area of concern. And this has been seen as a way of groups allocating profits inappropriately around, uh, around the group. So just by contractually saying that one company in a group is taking the risk, it has justified the movement of profits. So what the OECD have done in this area is devised a new framework for establishing who within the group is genuinely taking the risk and who should expect compensation for that risk. And in particular, the OECD guidance looks at the, the questions of control over the risk and the question of who has the financial capacity to assume the risk. There are some particularly difficult issues addressed in the OECD report, including what they describe as hard to value intangibles. And this could be, for example, a partly developed pharmaceutical drug, which is transferred within the group partway through its development. And one of the concerns here was that the taxpayer had a much greater knowledge of the commercial reality of the situation than the tax authority would. So the OECD have confirmed in the report that it's acceptable for the tax authority to use a degree of hindsight in trying to evaluate what the arm's length price of that drug was at the time of an internal transfer when the drug was only partly developed. Sharing of benefits from corporate synergies is also addressed in the guidelines in more detail. And there's a nod to the existence of location savings. And this is something that some countries, such as India, had been very keen to have included in transfer pricing guidelines. And there's an interesting point on the timing of the changes. The OECD have stated in their Q&A section on the website that the new guidelines are regarded as shared interpretations, presumably shared by the G20 and others who have taken part in this process, as to how the model treaty should be interpreted on the allocation of profits between countries. So in many instances, the changes will have immediate effects.
Now, of course, as well as the report on transfer pricing under Actions 8, 9, and 10, we saw a rewrite of the transfer pricing guidelines from the OECD on documentation. And we now have this three-tiered approach to transfer pricing documentation with a master file containing specific standard information which would be relevant to all companies in the group, local files for each local country, and for those groups with turnover in excess of 750 million euros, there's a requirement to have country-by-country -country reports which contain detailed information on specific economic data for that country, such as headcount, profits, turnover, assets, etc. Uh, and this, the intention here is that the country-by-country -country reports will be used by tax authorities as a way of identifying anomalies or potential mismatches in the allocation of profits that require further attention. Now, there's a number of countries that have already said that they will implement these new documentation requirements, including the country-by-country -country reporting. I'm going to hand over to Jay now to talk us through how that's coming into effect in China. Okay. Thanks, Michael. So, um, as, as John just mentioned at the very beginning, China plays a very active role in the BEPS discussion. So, we know that recently the Chinese tax authority also uh, revised the China TP rule um, uh, as their response to the, uh, to the BEPS action plan. So, for documentation requirements, China adopts the three-tier structure for documentation. According to the new China TP rule, the previous documentation report now is split into two separate reports. First, master file, in which companies must disclose a lot of group financial and tax information in a very detailed way. And secondly, local file, that follows the requirements set out in the previous TP rule with additional disclosure requirements for value chain analysis, foreign investment, and related party share transfer. Uh, one, one, one more thing which is uh, specific in the new China TP rule is that if the taxpayer um, is conducting some, uh, some, some, some conditions, for example, uh, the related party service transactions, cost sharing agreements, or their uh, financing, intercompany financing is subjected to the SYNCAP rules, a special issue documentation report must also be prepared together with the master file and local file. Next slide, please. So um, the threshold for master file and local file maintains the same as what was required in the old China TP rule, which are annual related party purchase and sales transaction amount exceed IMB 200 million, which is around 30 million euro or 20 million pounds. Other related party transaction amount exceed IMB 40 million, which is around 6 million or, uh, euro or 4 million pounds. And also that uh, companies with loss makings uh, that are conducted by some very limited functions. For special issue documentation report, there is no threshold for transaction amount on related party service, fa uh, service payment and cost sharing arrangement. For thin cap documentation, the threshold for debt to equity ratio is two to one for most taxpayers and five to one for financial institutions. Next slide, please. Um, China also adopts the country-by-country country reporting requirement. For country-by-country country reporting, the threshold of a group consolidated revenue of RMB 5, mid, 5 billion that China applies is almost the same euro amount under the BEP action plan requirement. China tax authority also holds the right to require, uh, request a country-by-country country reporting to be submitted if the holding company of the Chinese subsidiary is subjective to the country-by-country country reporting requirements in its own jurisdiction. Then I will hand it, hand it back to Michael, who will identify some suggestions on BAPS Action Plan 8, 9, 10, and 13. Thanks, Jay. So just taking a look at what we think multinational groups should be doing as a result of these changes to transfer pricing. I think as a minimum, groups should be looking at their transfer pricing documentation. It's something that needs updating on a regular basis anyway. But with a new three-tiered approach, and particularly with some countries adopting uh, a less tolerant approach to documentation rules these days, I think now would be a good time to take a look at what you've got in place and prioritize the updating of your transfer pricing documentation. Another thing multinationals should be doing is just looking at
uh, any specific areas that are being targeted by the BEPS initiative, such as uh, uh, companies with very little substance or where risk is perhaps allocated in an unusual way around the group, um, or any IP ownership structures that have been set up in the past, particularly if the IP is owned in a country where there is very little substance. And one of the things that we've been hearing more about from uh, our clients is that they are keen to do an economic substance review, looking at areas where they don't have uh, very much in the way of economic substance, but perhaps in the past have been reporting reasonable sized profits and just looking at some of the risks that that pre presents to them as a result of the, the BEPS proposals, the BEPS changes. So I'm now going to hand it over to Hans, who's going to talk us through treaty benefits. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Yes, uh, BEPS Action 6 um, is aimed at treaty abuse uh, because we see treaty shopping is happening on many levels and, and many occasions. It is to be addressed by BEPS Action Item 6. The recommendation is that there's, as a minimum standard, certain items that need to be included in the tax treaties. From the current preamble of tax treaties, it follows that they're intended to avoid double taxation. The suggestion is to add a phrase which makes clear that treaties are not intended to create double non-taxation. It's furthermore recommended that in treaties there will be both a limitation on benefits clause, similar to the ones found in the US double tax treaties, as well as a general anti-abuse rule or principal purpose test. If we look at the LOB, that's, that's a rather mechanical test, and one would need to check all the various options to see whether or not an entity or a person is a qualifying resident. This test is quite objective. In contrast, if you look at the principal purpose test, that's very subjective. It tests whether or not one of the main purposes of a structure or transaction was to get the benefits under the treaty. If so, then the treaty benefits would be denied. Finally, there is a suggestion that domestic general anti-avoidance rules can override the tax treaty. This is something we also saw in Action 2, the neutralization of the hybrids. If you think about it, then the effects of Action 6 could be very, very wide. The following aspects come to mind as being covered under Action 6. Holding companies, intermediate holding companies, conduit companies, permanent establishments located in third states, dual resident companies, transactions whereby you try to recharacterize the income, for instance, recharacterize a dividend into a capital gain. In the next slide, I will address the impact of BEPS Action 6 on the use of intermediate holding companies. So why would you want to use a holding company? On this slide, I have listed a couple of non-tax considerations for the use of a holding company. But we also know, of course, that sometimes holding companies are just used purely as a tax planning tool. So let's keep these tax and non-tax considerations in mind for a moment and then ask the question, what does Action 6 mean for holding companies? Next slide, please. If you look at Action 6, then it seems to deny that holding companies can have non-tax reasons as basis for their creation. Because even if there's one or more non-tax reasons, tax is always a consideration if you think about it. Because you do not want your holding company to increase the tax burden of the group. So if you consider tax in this context, is it then still one of the main purposes? I would think so, because the holding company would normally be set up in such a way that the tax for the group is not increased. So for holding companies, it's probably problematic to meet the principal purpose test. So does it then mean that most holding companies will fail? I would think that a publicly traded holding company would be fined. Same for a company where the holding company function has been added on to an operating business. So a large economy add-on holding company. Also, if the holding company does not get more treaty benefits than its members, then it should be fine as well. On the other hand, widely held special purpose holding companies 
joint ventures in a neutral territory, they will probably fail under the new rules. Next slide, please. So, what can be done for holding companies? Well, you can think about increasing the substance and activities to pass the LOV tests and remove tax as a main purpose, where I see that the latter is probably easier said than done. As mentioned before, tax always is a consideration since the holding company must not increase the tax burden of the group. It will also be important to check whether you actually need tax treaty protection. For instance, if it's only capital gains, then often you don't need protection from a tax treaty. You can also think about revisiting your transfer pricing strategy. Reduce profits in the countries where you no longer can use holding companies to extract profits under reduced withholding taxes. Now I move over to, to Joe. He's going to talk us through the proposals on permanent establishments. Okay. Thanks, Hans. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is this best action item that really addresses certain structures or arrangements that have been employed to avoid having a PE in a jurisdiction and therefore avoid tax in that jurisdiction. Uh, the changes that are suggested as part of this action item, um, if once implemented, will likely result in taxpayers having more PEs in a foreign jurisdiction. Um, the first one really deals with commissioners. The report, uh, the BEPS report discusses how a foreign enterprise that uses commissioner arrangements, which are pretty common, they may avoid P status because it is able to avoid the application of the dependent agent uh, rules uh, to the extent that the contracts concluded by the person acting as the commissioner are not binding on the foreign enterprise. Thus, no PE if the commissioner does not have the ability to conclude contracts in the name of the foreign enterprise or bind the foreign enterprise. Thus, taxpayers have been able to employ these arrangements to avoid having a P in their jurisdiction. You'll see there's some language there which um, expands the scope of this rule where it, it would apply if you conclude contracts or plays the principal rule leading to the conclusion of contracts that are routinely concluded without material modification by the enterprise. So uh, as I mentioned at the outset, there's a lot of uh, structures that employ commissioners. This is something that really will need to be reviewed, and that's something we could help with um, BDO International because we, we have um, experts in all the foreign jurisdictions that could help, uh, help you in implementing different structures perhaps to avoid PE status relating to commissioners, as well as many of the other items I'm going to talk about. Uh, next slide. The next one really deals with the independent agent exemption, and this, is, this change is really designed to limit the definition in cases where a person acts exclusively or almost exclusively on behalf of one or more enterprise to which it's closely related. So it's really designed to get at the closely related agent and to avoid, uh, it's designed here to prevent relying on the independent agent exemption. Um, the next, next slide, Next slide, please. Um, the next one really deals with preparatory and auxiliary exceptions. Um, this really deals with the new type of economy we, we exist in. Taxpayers often rely on, uh, and this is what the report kind of flushes out, taxpayers are often relying on the preparatory and auxiliary exemptions uh, contained in the trees to avoid having a P in a jurisdiction. Um, the OECD has determined that in many of these cases, that previously were, in many of these cases, activities that were previously considered preparatory and auxiliary in today's economy, especially the digital economy, may, may correspond to core business activities of an enterprise. And I, there's an example in the commentary involving a warehouse used for storage and delivery of goods online as not being a preparatory and auxiliary. You can see here the solution is that each of the exceptions is restricted to activities that are otherwise of a preparatory and auxiliary character. So there's changes to the language dealing with this requiring each and every activity and all of them uh, on a combined basis be preparatory or auxiliary in character. Um, next slide. Next one really deals with fragmentation of activities. 
And this is designed to uh, prevent taxpayers from claiming that they don't have a P in, in situations where the foreign enterprise or the, the foreign enterprise along with related entities fragments a cohesive operating business into several small operations in order to argue that each, each part is merely engaged in preparatory or auxiliary activities that benefit from uh, the preparatory and auxiliary exception. Um, this particular rule on, on this slide is really designed to prevent taxpayers from employing these structures to avoid PE status. So you can see that all of these uh, that I've been talking about so far are really designed to expand the definition of a PE and therefore taxable presence in a jurisdiction and therefore correspondingly taxability in that jurisdiction. The next slide um, really deals with splitting up of contracts. Um, the OEC stated in its commentary that Article 5.3 of the typical OECD model which applies to construction sites has given rise to abuses through the practice of splitting up contracts between closely held enterprises to avoid PE status. Um, here, one of the one of the um, one of the ways of addressing this is the principal purpose test rule that was previously discussed by Hans that is added to the OECD model as a result of the adoption of Action Item Six. So that's designed to address these types of situations. Um, but once again, this involves splitting up um, contracts to avoid, often it's 12 months, to avoid uh, PE status. Uh, next slide. So um, once again, I think I mentioned this, that you have the principal purpose test and the commentary show include an option for an automatic aggregation clause. So. Once again, all of these items that I mentioned here really are designed to expand um, the definition of PE dealing with dependent agents, independent agents, fragmenting business, and splitting up of contracts. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jay to give some commentary from the Chinese perspective. Jay? Yep. Thanks, Joe. So, um, so PE in China. So according to Guo Shui Fa 2000, uh, 2010, number 75, China's domestic treaty interpretation rules has already addressed several issues mentioned in Article 7. For example, the determination of a PE has to consider whether there is a fixed place, the permanency of the business activities, and the business nature of such activities. The real meaning of the term business includes not only production and operation activities, but also business activities carried on by any nonprofit organizations, with the ex exception of preparatory or supportive activities carried on for any such nonprofit organizations. However, whether the, the permanent establishment of any such nonprofit organizations obtain business profits should be determined according to further tests. The other example is that, normally speaking, a dependent agent who receives commission is not treated as PE of the foreign company. But if this dependent agent signs contracts on behalf of the foreign company and even negotiates the price and terms, this, this dependent agent is therefore regarded as the PE of that foreign company in China. So in the future, as a response to Action 7 of the Best Action Plan, China Tax Authority will consider to incorporate their recommendation in future negotiation of double tax treaties with other countries, and they will continue to improve PE administrative rules and practice. That's the, the China SAT's opinion towards Action 7. And now I will hand over to Malcolm, who will share some view on harmful tax competition. Thanks, Jay. I'm just going to take a quick look at preferential tax regimes, which is something that was addressed under Action 5 on harmful tax competition. So a number of countries have preferential tax regimes, and these are regimes that provide low effective tax rates on certain types of income. Typically, the regimes apply to income from intangible assets. And really what they're trying to do is they're designed to encourage higher value adding activities to be located in that particular territory. So the OECD took a look at how desirable 
this type of regime was. And the good news is that there is consensus from the from the BEPS review that it is acceptable for countries to to have these kind of regimes, but only if they relate to technology IP. So they're not keen on them relating to any kind of marketing intangibles. And only to the extent that the IP within the regime has been developed in that country. So that's sometimes referred to as the uh, the nexus approach or the modified nexus approach. And this work really resulted in a large part from discussions between the UK and German governments on the workings of the UK's patent box regime, which is one of uh, many of these types of regimes, which as a result of the, uh, the BEPS proposals, there have already been announcements that the UK's patent box regime is going to be modified. And I think we can expect other similar regimes around the world to be modified in similar ways so that they satisfy the dual requirements of the, the nexus approach and the restriction to just technology-based IP. So now it's back over to John for some general observations. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Um, first, let's uh, let's hear from uh, again from Joe uh, with respect to the U.S. view. And Joe, everyone is always interested in how the U.S. government is reacting to the BEPS project. And I know you've already talked a little bit about this, but could you just summarize maybe the concerns of the U.S. government with respect to the, any BEPS recommendations, and what uh, does the U.S. support? And just expanding on that, what's the likelihood of any sort of meaningful BEPS implementation in the U.S. In the near future, yeah. Well, let me try to address a couple of these. Uh, as a starting point, I think the U.S. in general has been an active participant in the BEPS project. They generally support the BEPS project. I, I think one of the concerns that the U.S. has had, as well as U.S. companies in particular, but also the U.S. government, is consistent application of these BEPS action items. Uh, one that we discussed here was the principal purpose test with the trees, very subjective. Um, can different countries potentially read that differently and deny treaty benefits? It's, it's a possibility. Um, different applications or over applications, for instance, with the hybrid rules, uh, will some countries take an overly aggressive approach with, with, with uh, hybrid arrangements? Um, so I think these are some of the concerns that they have. There is a lot of uncertainty. U.S. companies are, are uncertain about the consistency of these rules being applied in various jurisdictions. Some countries will adopt them, these measures, some won't. One, I guess, overlying concern about um, among U.S. businesses, U.S.-based multinationals, in particular, is country-by-country -country reporting. Um, that is going to, as a result of country-by-country country reporting, a lot of jurisdictions will have a lot of information about multinational groups. One concern that has arisen as a result of that particular action item is, will different countries, uh, after reviewing these reports, look at them and apply different measures in determining how profits should be taxed? Um, you know, one jurisdiction may have most of the people located there, so they may view that jurisdiction as perhaps the jurisdiction that should receive most, tax most of the profits. There may be another jurisdiction that has more of the IP there or more of the um, high-end technical employees, and they may view their jurisdiction as being the one that's entitled to the most profits. Where that could be a real problem is, and I've used this example in discussing this with actually representatives of the OECD, is where you have $100 profit, is it possible to be not only double taxed but triple taxed on that by various jurisdictions that have information on the multinational group, each of which believes that they should be entitled to a greater percentage of the profit being earned. And although um, there are, there's an initiative to increase the mutual agreement procedure without mandatory binding arbitration, which can take a, a quite a while, you may have a, a multinational paying a tax multiple times on the same profit. As it relates to the U.S.'s implementation of many of these measures, um, I, I think it will vary on the measure. The U.S. has come out and said they will uh, issue regulations dealing with country-by-country country reporting by the end of the year, which is very soon. 
other recommendations made here, uh, many of the recommendations made, uh, may require uh, congressional approval. And for any of you who have been following politics in the United States, it's often very difficult to get things uh, uh, changed, tax law changed. We've been looking at international tax reform now for a number of years. I think it, both parties agree that needs to happen, but there's different views on how it happens. So whether these proposals get actually implemented, some of these proposals at least, will depend largely upon Congress approving them. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Obama administration has made certain proposals relating to quote unquote stateless income uh, that were very much BEPS-like proposals. But for those to be implemented, you need some type of congressional agreement. And that will be a little bit of a challenge um, given where we are politically here in the United States. Um, once again, I, I, I think from a U, U.S. business standpoint, one of the major concerns is uncertainty, um, how jurisdictions will implement these various rules. Uh, there's obviously a lot of rules we talked about here today, other ones dealing with implementing CFC rules. Um, these are all things that U.S.-based multinationals are going to have to monitor and determine what the impact will be on them. I, I know I've talked to a number of our clients already about the potential impact of these various BEPS initiatives. Many of these are already being implemented in various jurisdictions, uh, especially some of the jurisdictions dealing with hybrids, country-by-country -country reportings on its way. Uh, so um, I, I think some, some U.S. multinationals view that this will have a disproportionate impact on U.S.-based multinationals, largely because some of the items in here seem to be directed, quite frankly, at U.S. business, the rules dealing with hybrids. Um, you know, obviously, given our check-the-box rules in the United States, that's made it very easy to implement hybrid-type structures in your organizational structure. Uh, these rules will probably hit U.S.-based multinationals more than some other jurisdictions. So, um, you know, if you look at BEPS, theoretically, all these items should work in conjunction with one another. and they, they, their framework is designed for them to work together, but as we all know, different jurisdictions, different countries will adopt their own version of the rules, and some of these rules, there's some inconsistency, you know, some um, flexibility in how the rules are adopted, which once again leads to a lot of uncertainty. John, hopefully I've, in that I've addressed most of your questions. If I haven't, let me know, and I'm happy to addressed any particular item that I haven't addressed. No, that, that's fantastic, uh, Joe. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go to the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And Jay, um, China has very much so in recent years become much more concerned about preserving its tax base. Um, you already talked about uh, the Chinese response with respect to transfer pricing documentation. Um, overall with BEPS, what are the, ch the concerns the Chinese government has with the BEPS recommendations? What things do they support, and where do you expect the uh, Chinese government to act in addition to transfer pricing documentation? Yeah, sure. So um, as I mentioned uh, before, that China has actively participated in the formulation of these new international tax rules. So uh, what we see from uh, a China perspective is that the Chinese tax bureau think that it's very helpful for them to upgrade the tax regimes and for them to improve the domestic tax legislations and tax administration system. So in a word that uh, they are learning from the, uh, what the other countries do uh, regarding to uh, the, the, the bad action plan. And they, think, they also think that it's a good opportunity to expand the cooperation with other jurisdictions, especially in some CA discussions. But on the other side, uh, John, as you mentioned, the, the Chinese tax authority, they are always trying to protect China's tax base and provide a more stable and transparent tax environment in China. So what we will see that um, the Chinese tax bureau, how they, uh, what will, they will do to localize the best recommendations, I think they will try to localize it in a very smart way. So. Uh, meaning that on, on, on one side, they will try to um, implement some or all of the best recommendations, but on the other hand, they were also addressing uh, 
some uh, some specific China specific issues. For example, the those location specific advantages, market premiums, and the other things that the Chinese tax authorities they always uh, they always mention in the worldwide discussion. And and we we will also see a combination of uh, between the protection of tax interest in China and uh, versus the boost of the economy development. We will also see a combination of the reinforcement of tax administration versus the protection of tax compliance. So for the detail, uh, for the detail action plans that the Chinese Tax Bureau will take in the near future, um, the first one is uh, we believe that they will further revise the domestic tax, law, tax laws and regulations, which we already see that they, uh, they already revised the, the, China, uh, the, the basic uh, transfer pricing rule with a lot of new, um, new elements, especially the ones uh, that they refer from the best action plans that the, the, uh, the three-tier documentation uh, report structure, the country-by-country -country reporting, and also some other um, things that they, 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 they think that, that are missing in the old ones, for example, the service fee part, the intangible part, and some other, some other things. And they, they, they also localize the bad uh, packages in some, some domestic tax laws, for example, the tax administration law, and also the guard, the general anti-avoidance rules. And they are trying to adjust their international tax administration division by some reorganization uh, internally within the tax bureaus. They will try to establish the, establish the national tax risk monitoring system. And for some information exchange, they will use information technology to facilitate international tax administration. So uh, it, uh, in summary, I think um, China will, will still uh, trying to localize the best action plan but they will they will they will try to localize in a very specific Chinese way. Thanks very much, uh, Jay. Um, we're going to turn to Q and A now. Um, I'm not sure we're trying to, trying to keep you on time here. So I first want to get uh, Malcolm has been keeping an eye on the polling questions for us, and we've asked some interesting polling questions. And I just want to see um, get get a sense from him on the responses to that and any sort of themes that came out. Uh, came out of those responses. Malcolm, can you give us any insight as to what our viewers are telling us about the impact of BEPS on them? Yeah, sure, John, and thanks to everyone for answering the polling questions. We got uh, quite a few hundred responses to each of the questions. That's good to see. Um, not surprisingly, I think uh, more people are concerned about the changes to the transfer pricing regime than any other particular area of BEPS. And I think that's not surprising partly because Transfer pricing is inherently a gray area. There's no right or wrong answer. And a large part of the, the BEPS proposals is around providing, uh, having a lot more scrutiny around transfer pricing and a lot more sophistication in the approach to transfer pricing. So I think that is an area that is going to um, cause people to, uh, to look at their tax affairs in more detail. Um, interestingly, around about half the people who responded thought that the BEPS proposals are likely to have a, a, create a modest increase in the effective tax rate for their group. Uh, I was particularly interested to see that 2% of the respondents felt that the batch proposals would decrease the effective tax rate of their groups. I don't know if that's uh, just wishful thinking or whether they have uh, unusual circumstances, but that was uh, an interesting one. And uh, just an interesting answer around disclosure. Interesting to see that around 90% of the respondents in total uh, either supported greater disclosure or didn't mind about having greater disclosure. So not many people really seem to be too concerned about the additional level of disclosure that's being, uh, that's being created by the BEPS project. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Malcolm. And uh, I see we have two minutes left, so I'm going to give the first person who asked a question online, um, we're going to attempt to answer that one, and then I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, and I'm going to direct this question at Hans. Hans, this is your uh, topic area. It's with respect to Action 4. Um, and the question is, how are they proposing to do an EBITDA approach when we do not have unified accounting, uh, country, ca accounting methods country by country? Can companies choose the appropriate local gap for the definition of EBITDA? Yeah, 
Well, I think the answer uh, is likely to be dependent on the country where, uh, where the company is located because the BEPS proposals are recommendations. They need to be implemented in local laws. So it will ultimately be the local country that defines what EBITDA is for purposes of this rule. And as a consequence of that, if that's not unified, then there will be changes over the countries and that can again lead to unexpected results or, uh, or double taxation. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Hans, and I, I think that's right. I think that uh, that answer will depend on the domestic law. Um, we've, I've seen a great uh, some questions coming in. I've seen our panelists responding to those questions, so that's great. Um, we will try to get back to everybody, but if we don't, please feel free to contact any of our panelists directly. The contact details are included with the slides for the webinar. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we will email you the slides and a link to the recording in a few days along with your feedback survey. Please complete that feedback survey. We take your thoughts uh, very seriously and it will help us plan for our 2016 webinar series. Um, the contact details are there for all our presenters. It's right up there on the screen right now. Um, so please feel free to contact us with any of your follow-up questions. Um, in addition, we have a team of tax professionals at BDO across the globe of over 8,000 people. Um, they are all ready to help you with any of your tax needs. Please contact them with any of the, your questions and talk to them about how BDO can help you manage your global tax expense. I want to wish everybody all the best for the holiday season. For our American uh, viewers, happy Thanksgiving. And we look forward to welcoming you again to our 2016 webinar series. Thank you very much, everybody.